Meeting to order, please. Just for the show, just before 7 o'clock. First item on the agenda is approval of the minutes, January 2nd, please. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of January 2nd, 2018. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 You would oppose? Done. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing. Um, I guess I'll entertain a motion to open the public hearing. A motion to open the public hearing. Motion. Second. So, open a public hearing for an advisory opinion to the town council request for a future land use map amendment AP5 lot 6. 165A Tomaquag Road, Joyce K. Luzzi slash Joyce K. Luzzi Living Trust applicant. Yes, sir. Good evening. Kelly Fracasa for the applicant. Um, this is a uh, um, part of an application for the uh, town council, which, had, uh, which heard this matter on, uh, um, on Monday for a change to the comprehensive plan and uh, also. Uh, a zone change. I believe this, this board has already heard the matter once. Unfortunately, it's hearing it twice because uh, Genius here forgot to uh, file the uh, uh, comp plan change application simultaneously with the other one, so unfortunately it's being done piecemeal. Uh, this, I'm hoping, is going to be pretty simple. This property is uh, zoned special manufacturing. You know, this, that happened, I believe, back in the early 1980s. And I think my, my former partner, Vin Nakarado, uh, did that. But it's a, a, a small island of manufacturing in the sea of residential. The applicant seeks to change the zone classification from a manufacturing special back to what it used to be, to R1. Uh, she wants to sell the property, and selling it as a, uh, as a manufacturing property is going to be next to impossible. So, that's basically what we're, uh, what we're looking to do here. I think it's pretty straightforward. Got it. Thank you. Planning board members, any questions before we go to the audience? Can you remind me again if you agreed to all of the waivers? Is that right? And I'm fairly certain that we did. But if you'd like to uh, revisit them, I'm happy to do that. They requested a waiver from just about everything. Appropriately, that's not a good system. What's the town council um, requirements when it goes when a zone change request goes to the town council? There's an application with required uh, submission items, and so there, that's actually a request for the council to waive those items. And okay. they did that. Okay. They did that Monday night. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Anyone else playing board? Jim, you had. No, I mean, just to clarify, it's uh, uh, what, what's before us tonight is an advisory opinion to the council uh, changing the future land use map of the comp plan from its current manufacturing to medium density residential, which is uh, the same thing as R1. And so. Anyone in the audience wishing to be heard on this application this evening? I see no hands. I just have one. Yes? When it goes to R1, can it be subdivided? Um, let's see. Unless you know the answer to that right off the bat. I believe theoretically it can. Um, going back to R1 was a suggestion of the engineer just in case a future buyer uh, would would like to subdivide the property, but uh, my clients have absolutely no plans to do that. And whether uh, it can be subdivided, that's completely up to somebody else who owns the property. <coughs> as, as I glanced at it the first time, I would say potentially, I would, I would say that's probably the next thing that we could expect to see at some point in time. But uh, current regulations, if it was to be subdivided, calls for 60,000 square foot lots as opposed to the old 20,000. Okay. You know, yeah. So so you have to have 100 foot of furniture mm -hmm. per lot and 60,000 square feet. So you wouldn't get a great number of lots out of this on this property. Maybe maybe an additional one, maybe two. I didn't look at that close. But. We talked about the fact that there's an abutting piece of property in the same name. 
Uh, no, no uh, I think I may have asked this question previously. No immediate plans to merge or change or reconfigure the lots at this time? I don't believe so. Um, I don't know if the house on the adjacent lot is occupied. I know that the house on this how, uh, this property is not occupied. <coughs> Anyone else in the audience? Yes, Bob. If you waive um, all four or five of the um, conditions um, for the change over to R1, if it was subdivided, I would assume they may still need to do some of those. The new owner would need to do the water and septic and making sure that it's possible to be a house lot. So, if I interpret Jim's comment correctly, the town council is going to grant the waivers. We haven't made that arrangement. That was a public hearing, so right. it has to come up for a vote. At the vote, we can still discuss it. Correct. Yay or nay. Correct. So, so the planning board is not granting the waivers. Right. I had recommended that, but um, rather than the council. However, if indeed the waivers are granted by the planning board and the council when the house, if the property is sold, they would still need to um, do the septic and the water and the runoff and all those other things that I think are standard. Would that be correct? Or would that be waived for the next owner? Oh, no, no. These are just, these, these waivers are simply submission requirements. If somebody wants to go in and subdivide the property, they still have to satisfy all of the statutory and ordinance elements to obtain a subdivision. And uh, those would include all environmental factors. You'd have to show you have sufficient water, septic, and all of that other good stuff. And if this owner wanted to subdivide, once we've given them waivers, they don't need to do that? No, they would need to do they the same thing. They still need to do that. Yes. Okay. subject parcel here is 2.3 acres, so um, and again, you have an existing barn building and a few other structures on there, so even to get one more um, house lot out of it would be a stretch. You'd have to knock down some buildings or reconvert them to a structure, so you're not going to, you know, possibly to get one lot out of it. And, uh, you know, you'd have to follow all the regulations, get septic permits for the lots and everything part of the Of course. But uh, I, I don't see that being a big factor in this decision. Yep. And just looking at it visually, even if that were to occur, the resultant lots would be consistent with what I see in the immediate neighborhood. Uh, even though appreciating that the Deer Trail Colonial Village goes back to the, it's probably a couple of decades old. Okay, anyone else in the audience? Otherwise, Planning board, I'll have to take a motion. So nothing is put that easy to be said. So I'll take that as a uh, perhaps a motion to uh, uh, suggest, suggest a uh, yeah, So perhaps um, you would make a motion to approve because it's more consistent with the use and use and use around the neighborhood. For the conversion of this lot to an R1. And it's actually a, uh, and a lower an advisory opinion. So we're actually offering up an advisory opinion as opposed to Okay. So if you want to just change the words a little bit, So I make a motion to advise the town council with the planning board's first because I'm change the BP lot file and then back to the R1. So, I have a motion. Do you want to add any uh, uh, references uh, to support that, or are you just good with the way it's As an immense parcel, and can use becoming more consistent with the existing use in the surrounding neighborhood. Okay, good. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 opposed? <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So for now, we will close the public hearing. We make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Next item on the agenda is old business. It's a development plan review. I understand that this uh, applicant here has requested a continuance. So if there's anyone in the audience looking to be uh, looking to follow this application, Jim, do we have a uh, is it kick to the next month? Targeted for next month. So if you're following this application, come see us next month. Next item on the agenda, <clears throat> first item under new business, a three lot minor subdivision. It's a preliminary plan, AP 17, lot 16, Sawmill Road, Robert H. Goodwin, applicant. Yes, sir. Hey, hello. Sorry. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Dowdell, Dowdell Engineering. And I have had with me tonight Holly Goodwin, who is also uh, the sister of Robert Goodwin owner of the property. Um, if you remember, we were here with you before you for a subdivision across the street. I think you heard it in September. Um, that was the subdivision of 15 Sawmill Road with the existing house and two additional residential lots. Um, this is the property we're subdividing now is um, lot 16A, which is off to the east of the existing house on the opposite side of the road. Um, the land is high and dry. Um, above, um, basically a hill above Moscow Brook. Uh, sheet 1 is the existing condition plan. Sheet two is the proposed three lot subdivision. We have um, permitted septic systems for the three lots, uh, all four bedroom house plans. Um, all the Postcards went out to the abutters within 500 feet and uh, have pretty good soil conditions. Uh, plans are somewhat straightforward. Um, the houses will uh, be, you know, within the allowable building envelope, and the permitted septic systems are really uh, plans that uh, will will be able to uh, market the lots with. Um, we made a choice early on to stay out of the 200-foot riverbank wetland, so uh, our total disturbance is less than uh, one acre, uh, so it won't trip any kind of rifties permits and that sort of thing. Uh, sheet 3 is your typical vicinity map that's required in one, one half mile radius. Um, other than that, I'd say I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Thank you. Plain board, thoughts, comments? Bill, have we given any consideration to uh, no cut language for the front setbacks? Did your client entertain that kind of request? Um, I don't know how you would control that. I mean, the, no, no cut buffers in the front setback. Obviously, we've got to get through there with the driveway. Those would be accepted, of course. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Holly. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about anything. So what we're trying to accomplish here is just uh, reduced impact as we travel our town's roadways by reducing the amount of clearing that takes place in the front of the lots. If we're amenable to that, we can, we can work with the planner. We'll get up here. I don't think it would be, I don't think there's an awful lot along the roadway on that side anyway. You would have to tell me that. I'm not personally familiar with yeah, so. there isn't a <coughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it's an old meta, um, other than, you know, it hasn't been farmed in years. Um, there's not a real thick stand of 
for trees. So it's not applicable in every case. Obviously, if you had a you know beautiful stand of beech trees there, it'd be nice to protect those. But if that's not the case, I don't. I don't think that you know we had that access uh, for the backbone uh, down in this area. Um, and then we came across to do the test holes, but um, there's a lot of down trees. I mean, Sandy did a number on this area, um, so it kind of needs cleaning up. But the other thing is, uh, someone uh, buying the lots would obviously put the driveway probably in a different location than we're showing on these plans. Of course, and so um, what we've done in the past, again, only if it's applicable. Is that the verbiage of the clear, the no clear zone allows for the positioning of the driveway wherever it might be? Um, you would need to tell me if it's worth pursuing. I, I personally, I, I don't think so. Um, but I would almost defer to Jim to take a look at it and see if he. Jim, are you familiar with this? Uh, somewhat. Okay. I don't recall anything that significant. Okay, let's not make a big deal out of it. I know what I'm trying to protect. If it's not a deal, it's not. Okay. Where is Whispering Pines at in rel relative to this? Right down here. So this, right, is, right a, across. this is across the street. Because well, I can on, ride my on, bike on that. It's on the line. same side of the street, but it's, it's across. It's, it's this side of Moscow Road. Okay. Actually, it's on the other side it's of the on, street. Yeah, it's on, it's on this side of the street. Yeah. I guess that would be the north side of the street. Okay. Because it's a weird intersection there, right? Between Sawmill and when it comes to 138, there's like this little island in the middle there. Yeah, and actually Sawmill Road goes yeah, to different ways. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Right, right. That's, that's way over here. Okay. There's an island out here that's part of 138. Right. And you can head to the west or you can head to the east. Okay. And there's a couple of houses, like right on 138. Um, like, as you come off Sawmill, there's like a couple of lots there, like on your right-hand side, correct? Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, I, I, I think I do. If you're coming off 138, you're there's one house. You're coming off 138 and you're going on to Sawmill. Yeah, there's one house on your right. Okay. And they've recently redone that house. Yes. Yes. And, okay. and there right. aren't any other houses the rest okay. of the And so then down. you're the, we're talking, this is the next little bit. Exactly. Okay. All right. Because that road gets a little tight down there too, right? As you're going yeah, the, the, the town easy. actually had it moved back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, if you look closely at the plan, there's a 50-foot right-of-way. It starts at the beginning of lot one, not at the beginning, almost between lot one and lot two. The width of the road is actually 50 feet because the road used to come between uh, 15 Sawmill Road and there was a barn here. Mm -hmm. the garage is now. And uh, Goodwin's had it relocated with cooperation from DPW to, to where you now see a 50-foot right away and then it goes back down the two-route road. Three yeah. Three yeah. Yeah. So that section of the road has been rebuilt. <coughs>
<clears throat> the subdivision as proposed will not result in the creation of individual lots with such physical constraints to development that building on those lots accordingly, according to pertinent regulations and building standards, would be impractical. All proposed land developments and all subdivision lots shall have adequate and permanent legal access to, the, to a public street. Each subdivision shall provide for a safe circulation of pedestrian and vehicular traffic, for surface water runoff control, for suitable building sites, and for preservation of natural, historical, or cultural features that contribute to the attractiveness of the community, the design and location of streets, building lots, Utilities, drainage improvements, and other improvements in each subdivision shall minimize flooding and soil erosion. Now add that the final could be done administratively. I have a motion. Second. I have a second for the discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So if that's in the, if that's in the tree, the fence line, 
That means neither property owner can take those trees down, or does it depend upon how it's written? In the, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's looking a little crazy, but I mean, there's there's um, there's a lot going on in, in that adjacent field. We can, clear, we can clear up, up to the fence line. We can't just clear the whole line of trees. Well, I just want to make sure that your neighbor doesn't clear your tree, clear those trees. You, you're talking on this. Yeah, this line right and, and and back behind as well. Back yeah, back yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, there were there were several. I think they were already been cherry trees along there, but there the property line that uh, I was able to ascertain to come up with basically was a fence line. Okay. So you have the situation of what side of the fences are the trees going to be on? Okay. That's your question. I think so. They can't. Yeah. 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 I just worry that if the neighbor decides to remove those trees, then you're going to have a great view across there, which is <coughs> a, a different operation going on back behind. Right. I mean, there's logging, there's there's soil, there's lots of stuff going on back behind the property line. I would say that whoever owns the trees can do whatever they want, or whatever, on the side of property. Okay. Have you been, have you been down there on that stuff field that know what I'm talking about? Mm. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're talking we're, we're now. Worst case, worst case, uh, yeah. I, I know. Yeah. 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 Worst <laughs> case, we'd have to plant, you know, he's cut right up the fence line, we'd have to plant trees, more trees yeah. on our side. Yeah. That, that property isn't before you today. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I was just, just curious in terms of, uh, it, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, just making sure. It just, it's about the property. I just wanted to just clarify. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Planning board. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. I'm good. And, uh, anything on your end? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anyone in the audience on this one? <coughs> I see no hands. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please. I'm just learning. Um, uh, when people do sub subdivisions, um, do they have to um, do the well perk mm -hmm. before? Or do we, have, we we did what's called a subdivision suitability, mm -hmm. which means um, we did soil evaluations, we did test holes on a lot, um, so that uh, uh, the results came back approved, demonstrating that both lots could indeed support. A new septic system, not a new septic system. Yes. And what, um, what, because, what is that called? Subdivision suitability. And because it's subdivision suitability, um, the new house is still going to have to go in for a final septic design. They still mm -hmm. have to go in and, and, and get a final one. Sure, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, make a motion that we approve the preliminary plan and delegate the final plan approval to the administrative officer based on the following findings of fact, which I said five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is one through seven. So how about like the property by reference? One through seven, right? Yeah. So that's a motion. Second. Second. And for a discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Anna Chavis. I work for Clear White Energy Group. Um, and I'm here with Adi Osgood, friends of Reef Engineering, and Scotland Dean from Tetra Tech. Uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to, to be in front of you today, and particularly to the planner for all the time you've spent with us um, so far. Uh, and to, to start off, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to kind of deviate a bit here from the typical process and hold this voluntary pre-application meeting um, with the planning board regarding the proposed project. Um, we, we asked uh, Jim whether we could hold this with you guys, um, kind of given the changing nature of the solar ordinance uh, and now the, the finalized nature of the solar ordinance. And, and I think, um, Originally, the importance to to clear way of incorporating stakeholder feedback very early on in the process, um, and wanting to introduce ourselves and the concepts and uh, hear what hear what you have to say before we assemble a formal proposal to you. Um, so, since Clearway hasn't been in front of this board before, uh, I'll provide a quick overview first of of the company that I work for. So Clearway is one of the largest renewable energy uh, owner operators in the country with over 4,000 megawatts of solar and wind generation um, in 28 states and a pipeline of about 8,000 megawatts in development. We're a turnkey uh, provider, which means that we develop, uh, but also construct, finance, and, and most importantly to our business model, own and operate our project assets. So we have projects ranging from several hundred megawatts out in the Mojave Desert in California and Nevada. Uh, we have carport projects at uh, an array of, of Kaiser Permanente hospitals in California, um, a couple hundred megawatts of community solar projects in Massachusetts, um, and, and our primary business model of, of long-term ownership and operation of these assets means that we're kind of we're here for the, the long term with our projects, and, and as such, we are committed to, to working through the permitting process and ultimately the, the long term presence in a, in a collaborative manner um, and, and with key stakeholders in the towns in which we may ultimately become neighbors. Um, so, you know, appreciate again that the opportunity to meet with you early on here. Um, in terms of the project itself, you know, we certainly don't have a fully uh, or even partially baked project here. Still a lot of research and analysis to do. Um, so our goal here is really to introduce the project concept um, and start the conversation. The, the contemplated project that we're presenting is um, approximately eight megawatts AC right now. It's a ground-mounted array uh, on an approximately 195-acre parcel. Uh, in Ashway on 336 Woodville Road, owned by Edward Carapiza. Um, the project is, and I just, whoa, I'm to turn this to the next page. Oh. So the project is far north of the parcel. It's it's closer to 95 actually than Woodville Road, which is where it has where the parcel has frontage. Um, it is currently zoned RFR80. Therefore, we understand that in order to proceed, we would need to submit and have approved a zone change and an amendment to the comprehensive plan um, for the portion of property that's contemplated for solar. Um, so that's kind of an overview of of, of where this where this project is, uh, we're, we're excited about the project's potential because it would operate under uh, Rhode Island House Bill 8354 um, in, in a way that our other projects that we're uh, proposing in Rhode Island do, which allows us to sell electricity to Rhode Island uh, municipalities, <coughs> schools, universities, and hospitals, um, and provide a cheaper and, and cleaner source of electricity in comparison to existing utility rates. Um, of course, it's a, a clean source of energy um, and would provide significant economic benefits um, to the town in the form of increased uh, property tax revenue without um, the larger uh, 
social, economic, and environmental impact that some other types of de uh, developments can have. Um, you know, I, I, we submitted a pre-application narrative that provided a good amount of information. Um, regarding initial considerations with respect to biological and cultural and environmental features on site and with respect to the project itself. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions you have on that or go into detail on that. Um, but would specifically like to receive any initial feedback you have and questions or concerns or suggestions as you, as you look at this uh, proposed project and, and specifically discuss it in light of the new solar ordinance. Um, uh, so, so new and, and, and truly is a, a different regime than, than the old regime, um, you know, uh, recently. So we've been working on this project concept with the landowner for a while and recognize the new ordinance has key requirements and considerations that, that really do create a different process. Um, I think the most critical of which when, when we look at this parcel is uh, the maximum of 3% or 3 acres for the RFR80 parcel seeking to be rezoned, which of course would, would apply to this. Um, so, you know, as we uh, started to try to think about how this project would alter in light of the new ordinance, um, we understand that provision was put there for a reason, uh, in that obviously the town has been inundated with, with projects um, that have features or impacts that, that uh, contradict with where the town wants to go or, or what the town's vision is. Um, and you know, stepping back clearly hasn't been in front of the town before, but we've uh, been following along via video uh, recording and trying to understand what issues the planning board uh, uh, really doesn't like to see or um, it are, are specifically or particularly concerning. Um, and initially, we're pursuing three parcels in this town, and as we learned more about um, what the town's vision and goals are we paired that back to this one parcel here because we think it has some unique characteristics um, that may not trigger the kind of concern, uh, at least from our initial perspective, uh, that, that other projects trigger. Um, so we were drawn to this site for, for a number of reasons um, that I just want to quickly highlight before I conclude here. So first, you know, it has um, uh, I guess it has surrounding zoning that, um, it has the type of surrounding zoning that we were looking for in terms of an interest in not putting forward a rezone uh, change that would not flagrantly be considered spot zoning um, in that the parcel and specifically the area where the solar is contemplated is directly adjacent to a 245 acre parcel zoned commercial special um, to the east and then bordered by 95 to the north. Um, and then second, it has uh, kind of, our, our thinking had to do with the uniqueness of the parcel itself, um, its size, its shape, features, um, locations, and specifically this parcel is, you know, a, a really enormous one, 195 acres large, and the shape um, allows for an ability to develop a project that can be obscured from view, so as to not impact about our vistas or, or town aesthetics. Um, as currently contemplated, uh, the array is, is tucked pretty far back north in the parcel. I think it's about 2,700 feet from Woodville Road. Um, it's significantly, you know, we we're able to significantly set it back from neighboring properties to the east and west. Um, we understand there's a 40% clearing cap in the new ordinance that we would be able to meet. Um, and then there's sufficient existing vegetation surrounding it that um, it, it wouldn't be able to be seen even by you know, the landowner that, that lives on the property. Um, so we understand there's a provision in the new ordinance that allows for the planning board to contemplate unique characteristics of a parcel. Um, when there's, a, when there's a scenario uh, of balancing landowner rights with town values. Um, and certainly not standing in front of you here asking you for a decision with respect to that clause because we're, we're really at kind of step one here. Um, but did want to get in front of you and hear your thoughts and reactions to this proposal um, in light of the new ordinance. Um, so with that, I'll conclude.
conclude and um, happy to cover any project specific details uh, at the conceptual stage, um, but wanted to just solicit your, your initial thoughts. Thank you. Well, before we uh, give you the bad news, I certainly want to appreciate, uh, convey my appreciation for coming forward at a pre app to uh, at least introduce your project as opposed to uh, stepping forward with an advisory opinion on the zone change. So for that, I thank you. So, planning board, thoughts, comments? Where do I begin? First off, uh, I like the fact that we're going to pretty much designate whatever power is generated here at the hospital, schools, and whatnot. That's, that's a point in your favor. The zone change, in my opinion, is it's, it's a tall hurdle. <coughs> you know, it's, it's been in the forefront in hot containers, I'm sure you know, for the past six or eight months. You know. God bless you. <laughs> Couple things I like. Big huge parcel, I've admired it driving by it. Um, I assume it's residential in Woodland. That's pretty much it right now. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll commend you on not being a uh, gluttonous solar developer and only wanting to do 26 acres out of 200. Um, your argument that the Mashantucket Peapot's next door with their 250 acre parcel is a little swaying. Um, I'm not a fan of 95, so I could care less what goes on 95. I don't care. I know my colleague feels differently, but I could care less what the people from New York and New Jersey see when they're blowing through our state. They probably don't even stop again. So that's um, that's a that's a that's a plus in your favor for me. But I'm I've been consistent for the past eight nine months. I cannot condone a manufacturing facility in an RFR 80 zone. So while some of your stuff has merit to me, I I could never support the zone change. Um, and I assume you'd be asking for the whole 195 acres to be rezoned special commercial unless you have plans on subdividing. Yeah, we're not quite sure what route we would take, but I <clears throat> we would ideally n not want to rezone the whole parcel, limit it as to, to as close to the solar array as possible, particularly since... So you'd consider a subdivision? Yeah, I, mean, we, I would have to talk to a land use planner and, and council, there's, but there's, we're there's, looking at split zoning or a subdivision. There's absolutely no prayer for me to support pre-zoning the whole 208. Oh, sure. Well, you know, I, the landowner lives there, so um, there's not an interest in rezoning. There's, a, there's an interest, I think, on all parts in minimizing the rezone as, to the extent possible. So you don't take away any positive feelings. I would, my advisory opinion to the council would be negative. Uh, okay, so the first hurdle for me is the rezone issue. There's nothing unique about this property. This is the same old bag that we've been hearing for months. Residential, rural property looking to be rezoned for some kind of commercial use. Doesn't fly. Uh, I, unlike my colleague, uh, I'm not an advocate of sticking things on 95. So when you say it's 2,000 feet from Woodville Road, that's laudable, but the interstate is still uh, an artery that cuts through my community. And the last thing I want to be known for as the people from New York blow by is, oh yeah, that's where all the solar panels are. So the fact that you've snuggled it against the interstate uh, in an effort to buffer it from a butters, that's that's a logic to me that doesn't really work. So I, I, I was at the hearings when Mr. Carapesa uh, made his plea for uh, the returning to the 30%. Uh, town Council has spoken clearly to this. That's, that's going backwards for us. While the planning board initially supported that, that's not where we are right now. So this application just goes backwards. And I don't, I, I can't possibly. 
And I wonder if I just ask a question, just for the sake of sort of the dialogue and sort of understanding a little bit more where you're coming from. I'm curious, with regard to the ordinance and sort of the allowance for a special condition of the rezoning, was there a scenario by which that was envisioned to be applicable? Yes, of course. And, and what was that? Bring me a battered gravel bank. Oh. <clears throat> and now you've got a set of conditions where the planning board, I don't want to speak for my, <clears throat> my colleagues, but I'm pretty sure you would get a completely different <clears throat> Okay. We've done it in the past. That's a precedent. And uh, actually, I'm quite proud of the fact that the planning board endorsed that one. It was smaller, but there's a piece of distressed property that the entire neighborhood supported a rezone on. So I'm kind of thinking that's the scenario that the provision was inserted. Okay. This does not even come close to that. Not in my mind. That kind of scenario. Okay. And, and my and my second question was just with regard to sort of the, the visual impact from 95. I mean, to the extent that that is mitigatable, um, is that something that could be entertained or, or not? It's a plus. It's obviously going to be a plus for some people. I don't care. <laughs> you don't care. You care a lot. I guess that's why I'm asking the question. The primary obstacle for you, I mean, it's nice to talk about all these things, but the primary obstacle is the reason issue. Right. You've got to get a positive advisory opinion out of the planning board in hopes of getting to the town council. Right. And then you, you still have uh, an uphill fight, as Ron has mentioned. So, yeah, you can tinker with the project to make elements of it more palatable, but I still think you have some structural components that are going to be in the way. What was the percentage of the coverage of the solar array? 13%. How, how much, sir? 13%. 13%. 26 divided by 195 is 13. I think it might be, was it 13? 13. 13.3. Okay. 13. Okay. 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 It would have definitely flown in our previous 30% when we were discussing it in the report. Can you tell me a little bit, um, maybe this question is more for Jim. Crossing the wetlands, are those hard permits to get for these roads? I thought in previous applications, they folks really worked hard not to cross and having to get the permits to cross the wetlands. Well, it's my understanding that, that wetland crossings are not easy to come by, but I think there's at least three or four of them there. Right. And uh, so I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Carroll, here's might be able to address that. Are there some old farm roads that you're planning on using? There are old farm roads and there's logging roads. We keep most of this land under, uh, uh, we keep it as a wildlife refuge and uh, also forest management. So we're continuously, I'm not sure if you're aware, aware of, we've been clear cutting on that property for 50 years, 40, 42 years, I guess. I've owned it for uh, almost 50 years. And uh, right now we're cutting an 8 to 12 acre spot right near where that is. Based on the requests of DEM, the wildlife people of DEM, and the Department of Agriculture uh, Conservation, I forget what they're called, DEA something. It's an acronym for uh, Conservation Service. So they approached us and there's a shortage of cottontail rabbits in the area. So we're clearing 12 acres in the back to create habitat and building wood piles, brush piles, so they can hide from the coyotes and, and all the predators. So there's a lot of thinning that goes on in there. There's roads, as, as you asked. Um, just one other side, a comment, Hal, about 95. Not that I'm worried about the people driving by, but it turns out the very back of that property where it borders on 95 is high up. So this array sitting back there, even if you drove by on 95, you wouldn't be able to see the arrays. That's why I thought it was a good location, close to commercial. But that's why you guys are here. But I would also ask one other thing. For the first time, based on attending these meetings, I went through the comprehensive plan. 
and read it fairly carefully. I'm going to go back through it. There are a lot of clauses in here that really tend to support these things, like encourage to put solar facilities on the property, do developments near Interstate 95 on page uh, 54, encourage to, uh, to promote development adjacent to I-95, and many other factors. So my cut at it is, and I'm probably calling this one, is uh, I think you guys have the flexibility. That was the, the word, the clause I saw when they changed it to the 3% at uh, the 3 acres was the planning board had the discretion to look at specific parcels, specific conditions. It doesn't say just landfills and dumps and wasted property, but based on the situation of the, of the, uh, of the property, you have the discretion to think out of the box, if you will, find out if it, uh, if it fits. My cut, from a parochial standpoint, is that it fits the comprehensive plan. But anyway, I won't say any more. So I, I only ask that question because it answers the uh, uh, Amy's question about crossing the weapons. So right. these are not going to be, or at least you don't envision them to be, uh, virgin cuts through the regulated space. No, we're in the I presume the time. you're going to utilize right. uh, existing features that already meandered through the yeah. And the other thing, Al, is my understanding from talking to the wetlands people, and I'm, I guess there are people here, is that whatever wetlands you're close to is what they consider low value wetlands. In other words, it's forest wetland in and around that area, but it's what they consider low value wetland. Is that right? Is that what the term they use? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure that he's actually going to defer to, to Scott on that. Okay. And I want to clarify, we are um, working, just uh, initiated the process to start working with the DEM to understand how they would view these wetlands in light of our wetlands delineation. Um, understanding to your point that that is going to be uh, something that, that is a, con a concern that we will need to work through and ensure is, is uh, mitigatable. Uh, so there are three areas of wetland crossings. We tried to, after we conducted the delineation, we tried to figure out how we could avoid them to the maximum extent possible. Um, we're even trying to look into engaging with nearby landowners to try to use their property a bit and avoid one or two of the crossings. Um, but just that was an aggressive view to show since we haven't actually talked to them yet. Um, but right now, if we are limited to the parcel, there are our three areas where we would need to cross and we have to understand from the DEM what that would look like in terms of permitting that. Um, anything else to add? No, okay. that's it. So this, are there any other um, applications that have come, I, I don't quite understand why it's <laughs> um, the other applications that have come before us that have done the rezoning, there was a lot more housing. Is this less so of that? I'm not familiar with this parcel over here on the film. Like, in turn, this is RFR 80, right? Yeah, like a buddy. So what? What? So you mentioned the commercial. Um, what else is a buddy? Very little. Uh, there's a piece of land that belongs to the land trust uh, back here, but I think this. I could be mistaken, but I believe this is the closest residence to the field location which is probably it's 2,700 feet out to the road, so 3,000 feet, more than half a mile. Uh, there actually are probably closer residents across 95, but obviously this isn't going to have much of an impact on them. Okay. And the, the uh, tribal lands that are zoned commercial special are uh, this area. So, so this portion of the site Everything to the east that would be near the, the proposed field area is all part of that commercial special. So. And at 3% or so, it's not viable, I take it. Right, yeah. So even, even if there was increased technology and more ability to harness uh, into the conversion, it wouldn't be viable at 3%. Do you see it going there in terms of technology of being viable at 3% ever? 
No, not for, not for, it, it would result in a, co a couple hundred kilowatts worth, and the kind of, you just wouldn't be able to hit a return threshold uh, based on con capital cost and um, the development process to kind of justify that small of an array. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that from the time that we've heard applications, two years, two, two, three years ago, this has all started, that the technology has gotten better and they're able to have greater conversion with smaller um, areas taken. And so I guess my question is, is do you envision it ever being viable at 3% with increased technology? Sure, yeah, the technology certainly has gotten better and it continues to get better. For example, we're, a year ago, our go-to module was 350 watts per module. They're now about 400 watts per module. So you are able to fit more in less area, but it's not, those are just incremental increases, not not sufficiently kind of earth shattering where where you would be able to to make three percent um, or three acres pencil from a okay. investment perspective. Because thirteen is not far off. I mean, it is, but it's not right. Well, but three percent is absurd. Yeah, from my yeah. God. So I mean, the three. We, we went from great hundred percent coverage. So, we went from good, great one hundred percent coverage to three percent. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, so I, I mean, I feel you. I mean, thirteen percent. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, my biggest struggle is rezoning the two hundred acres. Yeah, there's no there's no proposal to rezone the 200 acres. There's well, a line on there. Now that's what you'd have to do. Well, my house is sitting. My farm is sitting on. That's okay. Line. You can. We do don't it. want to rezone the whole thing. Why would we rezone? rezone my understanding, working with the planner, is that there's no problem to create a split zone on a on a parcel, and that only the area of the field would be need to be rezoned. Am I am I on the wrong page someplace? Yeah. Without subdividing. Oh, you got to create a new lot to rezone. Jim, straighten out. We can't just. Yeah, I don't think I ever meant to say. We're not going to create a lot out in the middle of space. Yeah. We're, we're not calling call it a zone. Create a lot. He's talking about split, split zone. zoning. Yeah. I don't think I ever said it was, you know, easy to do. I mean, it's, I, I've seen them, but that would be up to the town if they want to create a split zone line. Right. But there's, there's, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but my understanding is there's nothing that prevents that from occurring it's at the discretion of the board and the planning board and the town council just like the brother of three zone enough that it's nothing that requires the entire parcel to be rezoned to allow a, a commercial line. Well how you about could, other you could, request, you could request to shift the zone line. Sure. You could request that of the town council and see what they think about it. See what the planning board thinks about that. Shift the zone line from the commercial over from the Mass and Tuckets? That's that, that could be what their request is. I'm not telling them what their request should be. I mean, they, could, they could request that. I spent most of my career trying to undo lots that have suffered from split zone decisions in the days gone by. That, that would not really be something that I would endorse right off the top. Well, that, that is true. I mean, so, sometimes they create more problems than they're worth. But, I, but it is, they are out there. <coughs> this could be an exception. I don't mean to paint with a broad brush, but boy. Talk about a bag of cats. I, I've never requested what, that before either. I understand exactly what you're getting at. Um, so, but for a number of reasons, we think this this site and this use are unique. And that, so I guess enough to say that for continued discussions, you would be amenable to a portion of the site being resolved. Correct. If a, if a mechanism could be correct. Right. And we would prefer, prefer, not just in that hole, but definitely prefer that. Yeah. That might make some people feel better. Yeah. Okay, so uh, planning board, other questions, thoughts? No, just to, from my standpoint, I kind of agree. I don't like the next to the highway where you think it's visible or not. There's already one that you can kind of see as you drive 95 north. And just the, the rezoning itself is the, the reason I'm on this board. So I'm just not supportive of that change. <coughs> We have 
projects in this town and, and neighboring towns that really make the solar industry look bad. They're, they're just an nice one. That's why all this discussion is going on. You know, I agree with Tom. What happens on 95 is their business. They're not going to buy gas. They're not going to stop for a meal. They're going to zip right through and hit Massachusetts as fast as they can. And once they get past that West Greenwich town line, what do they got to look at? It's not much. You got a prison. Not much other than that. So. I think I said enough. <laughs> okay. Let's keep it going. You do that. Uh, yeah, and, and it's going to sound strange, but in, in terms of siting, so I own the Conservation Commission. My job is to protect the trees and whatnot. This is one of those siting instances where I think it's well sited. I understand the difficulties in, in getting permits to cross the wetlands. I understand that it is not currently zoned for it. I'm wary of, if it were to change, what that might elicit from the neighbors. Uh, what would the Mashantucket Peat Lots do with their commercial special property? I don't know what they're permitted to do on this. I don't know why it's special. Um, but. Given that 95 is on the north side of the property, they won't want to remove any trees. There will be 100 feet of trees between 95 and this. There's a, I, I can picture that cliff ridge along 95. It's 20 feet off of <coughs> up above the yeah. No one's ever going to see this from 95. Not that I care either, but I also don't want to be known as a solar <laughs> kind of place. Um, you're not, you don't want to put houses there. There's nowhere to put a driveway to put a business there. Um, it doesn't break up the contiguous forest space. I don't know. I, I'd be I'd be hard pressed to say why I wouldn't go for this one. There, most of the ones that I see, uh, they're they're poorly sited and they're they're, they're poorly installed. But I don't know. I'm having a hard time shooting this one down. And I know that that's out of character for me. Um, <laughs> and it's if it if it were not a buddy. An existing commercial zone, I might think differently, but it's a peninsula that sticks out between commercial and 95. So I can see it would cause, it might cause concern with these two properties here. I'd give them a lot of thought. That makes your sense. Excellent. Uh, Jim, anything to add on your end before I okay. can always come back? So, appreciating that it's a pre-application, I'm not obligated to go to the audience, but everybody's here, everybody's interested. Let's hear from audience. So you're here first. Hi, my name is Joe Moreau. I appreciate the fact of, of the pre-application process, and I, I commend you for that. Um, you mentioned Hopkinton several times about solar, and I'm not sure how much research you've done. If you look at, and you can Google this, uh, Woodville Alton Solar Project. If you Google Brushy Brook Solar Project, it's basically uh, we're not opposed to solar in the right area. It's a brown field, it's an airport, it's zone commercial, that's fine. Our issue is when you take residential property and you try to rezone it to commercial. You're, it's a manufacturing at that point. Um, if you look, there's a GoFundMe page right now of over $22,000 that has been raised to fight these zone changes. They're not consistent with our comprehensive plan, in my opinion. Um, we started one petition with over 600 residents in Hopkinton that signed that petition. There's two current petitions that are out. It's well over 200 people that have signed that petition against changing residential to commercial. You may have a great project, but unfortunately, it's on residential property. And that's basically what myself and several hundred other residents. The first meeting that we had for Woodville Alton, we had to move it from the capacity here of 73 to Charleville Middle School. And all current meetings were at that middle school. And at one point, I, I can't remember the meeting, there was 110 residents at one of the meetings opposed to this. So I appreciate what you're doing, but I'm trying to save you the expense, and, and I'll tell you what you're going to go through from the resident's standpoint of uh, what's going to happen, and we're opposed to that. 
Thank you. Barbara, yes. I have two questions. What is the megawatt? It's 8.1 AC. 8.1 point AC, not DC? That's an AC, right. 8.1 megawatts AC? Yes. And um, I have a question for Al, actually. Um, have you ever done a split zone? I mean, I have never, I mean, since I've been here, I've certainly never seen you do it that I know of, but have you ever done a split zone? You're asking me as a planning board member? Well, as a planning board member, uh, no, I mean, was it before I, your time? I don't know whether you've ever done it. I, I just don't uh, know. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not, I can tell you it's not unheard of. But I don't know that Hopkinton has done it in decades. Well, I don't know if we've done it, but there are split zone properties. Yeah, but I mean, the, the liquor store that just went in in Bradford, they changed the whole configuration of the store because part of the store was inf infringing on the manufacturing zone and part was in a residential zone. And so that, that was Bradford in for Hopkinton. Yeah, the new Brad, you know, the package store yeah. where, yeah. where Star was doing this. That's true. The line was there and they modified yeah. it. Yeah. So, 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 so it sure exists, that, but we didn't. We surely didn't create it. But, but in, my, in my recent recollection, I, I can't recall being involved with one of the things. Yeah, I, I just don't remember mm -hmm. you doing that. Whether, but it could also be that the set of circumstances that would drive that kind of request simply have not materialized. But that would have been over thirty years. I know that's what I know. <laughs> I think it's been decades since that's even been addressed. I, I think you'd be shocked if you, if you looked at the land use map, how many properties are split zone already. I think you'd be shocked. Yeah, but that would be before. Correct. That would be before. So if they, so it, at the moment, my understanding is when a parcel wants to change to commercial special, it's the whole parcel. It's not split. That's it's the, the entire done. parcel <clears throat> becomes commercial special. Yeah. Well, there must have been provisions. Look at properties like Jim Thompson's sawmill. A family house is right there, and the rest of the property is zoned commercial special. So maybe I think there's plenty of examples in the town of that being done, but maybe it occurred years ago or something. I, I don't know. Most of the ones I know about predated zoning. Exactly. And then, and then when exactly. we decided to be the grand poobahs of the world and create zoning, you know, we drew the lines wherever the, the town felt they should be drawn. They didn't go with property. They want to dis oh, Barbara, is this a question that we should ask the zoning board? Uh, um, I, I don't know. I think it's. I, I think what's interesting, and the reason that I didn't want three percent or three acres, I wanted zero because either it's going to be approved as a unit or it's not. Because the problem is, and I, as I understand it, is when you are rezoning those parcels, the entire parcel is commercial, which means I get to tax the entire parcel as commercial let alone the solar. So it isn't like you can have a nice little house and a nice little high on farm, and by the way, I'm doing 15 or 20 acres of solar. I, you're going to do the entire parcel, which is where the town gets funds from. So I am interested in whether they're going to rezone, but when I talk to Liz Monti, the assessor, I mean, this is a nightmare coming, because you're going to be rezoning in order for these things to work, even if even if I like it, and I think it's a possibility, it's called how do we handle it technically right. on the ground. I would um, think there's got to be a provision to subdivide the property. Oh, I'm sure. And create parcel number A as commercial special, and the rest of it leave as. And I don't think we've done that in decades. You can say a lot. Of Split zone lots, uh, negative and positive, probably mostly negative. They are, I agree with you, Al, they are uh, oftentimes a headache. But where I've seen where I've seen the split zoning technique used over in Charlestown is on your major thoroughfares, Route 1A, Route 1, you have a lot of large acreage parcels along those thoroughfares. And the thinking is that I'm sure you're familiar with the zoning map over there as well as I am, that you can, you can have like two, three, five hundred feet, let's say, in from the road where you want your commercial development to be located, and the remainder back portion is residential. 
So yeah, I mean you can you can almost do anything you want if there's a good enough reason to do something. You have to you have to ask the fundamental question. Yes. Is what is what's being contemplated here a good thing for the town or a wanted thing for the town or not? If it is, we'll find a way to get there. But if if, if it's not wanted, then different story. And Jim, by the way, you you have the words in the comprehensive plan which I read for the first time in detail in the last couple of days. You have, here's one page, it says, encourage renewable energy projects. Consider expanding the current zoning regulations to allow photovoltaic installations in residential districts. That's on page uh, 55. And you have other clauses in the comprehensive plan that would lead one to believe that the town wants renewable energy and specifically in residential districts. Well, I've seen a lot of comprehensive plans in my day, and you can pick out, a, on any project, you can pick out assertions here that support the project or, or do not support a project. Because uh, I'll pick out some things in the comprehensive plan that would not allow these things. So we can all, we can all play that, that game if you want to. But with, with respect to the specific um, section that you just referenced there, it also boils down to interpretation. I could very easily interpret that is that yes, the council the, the council put that in there, the board put it in there to contemplate at some point in time the rollout of solar the, uh, farms into residential districts as a whole, not on a piecemeal split basis. Okay, now as you know, the town already currently allows them on commercial properties, manufacturing properties, and small ones on farms. So when I look at that. The citation that you just made there, and I have talked with several town councils along the way, we were contemplating on if we choose to roll these things out and into RFR80 properties, how would we do it? What standards would, would we put in place? Would there be minimum lot sizes? Would there be maximum coverages? Would there be, we never really had that discussion yet. The town. So, I mean, you know, I can... Yes, exactly. I, I'm just saying, I was just going to say, I like this one. <laughs> That's good. Oh, God. Uh, but when I read, read, read that part on the comprehensive plan, I thought that they, that they really were talking about the, the farm variance. Because the farm variance, that viability variance, the farmers still are zoned RFR80 but they have solar on them. So, it, and, and, and you know, they made a whole different ordinance for that. So when I, every time I looked at the comprehensive plan, I thought they were talking about the farm viability. That that but was it the says extension. residential district. But they're residential. Right. The farmers are still residential. They've not changed. They didn't change the zoning, right? It only says consider. It doesn't say do it. I just yeah. We're not going to debate that. Saying. No, I know. But I mean, so I, 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 I really kind of like the fact that it was next to the commercial uh, uh, property on the right. And, and I really was going to ask you, what did those two people on the left think? Have you talked to them? I think Ed has. The, yeah, the people on the left. Uh, okay. Landing. Who owns the land? Michelle Lorney and yeah, um, here, sure. and see. the Johnson I can't see trust. Right. The Johnson the Johnson yeah, the, the land trust bought they wanted us to buy it, but but we're yeah. Oh my gosh, this is confusing. Okay. Yeah, we're still brothers here. Okay. Yeah, there are two people that own the lands here. All right. One is um, excuse me, Jimmy Johnson. So you can see it. No, no, mind. There are two triangular parcels to our uh, west of yeah. the property. One is owned by uh, old dear friends, uh, Cindy and Elwood Johnson. You guys must know them. Cindy's on the uh, the land trust board. Elwood is an ex, uh, you know second in charge of the state police of Rhode Island for years and years. So they've had that land for a long period of time. And I, my sense is eventually they'll probably just donate it to the land trust because it's adjacent to the land trust. And Cindy's been involved with the land trust for years. Uh, the other land, I think, is owned by a fellow who's recently deceased. 
his daughter came and uh, wanted to sell the land to me, but it's 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 that other little triangular piece right along 95, yeah. and we we didn't need any more land, so he probably is going to give it to the land trust too. So I think if it's not now, probably in the next uh, uh, couple of years, all that land to the west of my property will be land trust, except the housing lot that's real close to Woodville Road. And the land to the uh, east of it is the Mattapoisett Indians own it for, uh, you know, commercial, commercial special. All right, we had a question. So, uh, just a couple of things. Because I asked some questions some time ago about the split bill with various people. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? You already had a house on a large property and you wanted to do uh, a rezone for solar. And I can't now remember all my sources, but they had it suggested to me that uh, uh, it's possible to do the rezone to commercial manufacturing, whatever. And at that time, also approve somehow that house that's already there, uh, being able to be there still. I know when we did some some projects here in town, uh, when when we had what was used to be the Pavilion Restaurant, there was a house there that was uh, allowed to continue. Uh, matter of fact, I think we had people, uh, including myself, speaking in favor of that house being there still to have someone there at night to look after, you know, a large property where somebody might come in and, uh, and, and do some damage. I know we have an RV park. Uh, I believe RV park is an RFRA zone, but I know the, uh, the Ashley RV park has a house on it. So it's really mixed uses, whether it's allowed in the zone or not. So I think there's flexibility uh, to even have something stay on the property. Uh, part of the thing that I was interested in in this area right here uh, that Mr. Carpeza has is uh, trade-offs that are beneficial to the environment. We have uh, what he's saying is 26 acres of solar. It's possible to, is to do a deal where you get uh, a conservation easement on the remainder of the property other than the house or whatever needs to be taken out of it so that you have a benefit coming to the town from doing a project like this. Uh, I have read, say, over at the uh, solar hearing at, uh, at Chero that, uh, that, that his pond there is considered by the state to be the top quality of the uh, rookery. I don't know if that's extremely significant or not, but I know that I enjoy going by there and seeing the, the bird activity. And I would love to see as much uh, preservation that could be done in there as part of a, a trade where he's getting something that's financially good for him, the town's going to get taxes, and we get, and we get some true conservation benefits. I would love to see, uh, I, I was aware of those other properties, those other two triangle properties, I've gone back there and hiked that, that property that the land trust uh, has and looking for ways maybe even to connect up and get up to the Mash and Tucket uh, property because that's where the old Narragansett Trail was before 95 chopped it off. And uh, that's an area that I'm quite interested in. There's a lot of Native American stuff up on that property too. And it may be that that property can be preserved or worked with. And if, if they have native stuff on this property. I mean, I've got to do this little panel five feet sometimes, you know, to save something that's really significant, and then it's a lot of stuff that's, you know, not very significant. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so there's a lot of things there. And just to throw in my 10 cents worth, uh, 95 to me is a scenic highway through Hockington. Uh, <laughs> I enjoy my ride through. I don't just <laughs> do my to the metal and zip through. I mean, I really enjoy it. I, you know, I, I love just looking at the stones and, that are cut when you go through that hill. Oh, I guarantee you, you will never see a solar array on that particular thing because it's like, like you say, 20, 30 feet above where 90 miles <coughs> So it won't, it won't impair your solar, your uh, scenic view. So, so my point anyway is that uh, if you can do some trade-offs, we could be a, a benefit to the town. So you shouldn't just shut the door 
on these things automatically. You should look at each one uh, individually and, and weigh it all out. Thank you. Jim, you had a thought? Uh, just as a point of information for everyone, um, not only do we have split zone lots in town, um, our zoning ordinance actually has a section, section 32, that uh, pertains to these things. It says lots divided by a zoning district boundary. And uh, it's one sentence that applies here. It says, where a lot is divided by a zoning district boundary, the regulation for either zoning district shall apply, except that no district shall, in effect, be extended more than 30 feet into an adjoining district. So I'll let the zoning official interpret that for you. But anyway, I just want to let you know that we do, um, you know, we have contemplated it, and uh, it's, it's there. So sounds like it addresses existing conditions, though. Not that it can't be done. It can be created. If it's, if it's worthy. Sure. Exactly. On the uh, Brushy Brook proposal, there were several financial benefits or gains to the town. Um, the bottom line is it's still residential to commercial, and the residents are opposed to that, regardless of the financial benefits. I understand the town needs to, to get revenue, but our point, when I say our, I'm talking about several hundred residents. Um, our position is, and what cost? We're not here to sell off and trade, um, you know, pieces of our property just for the sake of changing residential. Um, people buy residential, they expect that property to be residential. I, my biggest fight was I had a piece of property, I bought residential. Before we bought that property, I came here to the town hall. 100, 200 acres across from me, I wanted to know what it was zoned. It's zoned residential. If it was zoned commercial, I would have never bought my house. So I think that's the bottom line, and sometimes we lose sight of that. It's residential you're trying to change to commercial manufacturing, because it is manufacturing. Do you, do you contemplate... Um... We can hear you without the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just an instinct. <laughs> Do you contemplate, uh, I know there has been a couple of zone changes in the town in the past. Um, is there kind of a, a clause that only allows for solar use and then when the solar is removed, the, the land is preserved or the zone reverts back to residential or just there is some limitation on no other use. You know, it's commercial special and that special is only solar um, in effort to alleviate concerns with other potential more impactful uses. So, Jim, please straighten me out here, but having been around a little while, the term commercial special in itself is a little bit of a misnomer. There is no commercial special zone, right? It's in the comprehensive plan further in the beginning, and yeah. then you change to when you got rid of the special parts, right? That's, that's the current part. <clears throat> Commercial special was created as a catch-all for the mistakes that we made in the past. This was before right. the time. Oh, okay, right? okay, okay. We have it now because we had to formalize this term. But when we were creating zones, there was no commercial special. It was, what do we do with all these mistakes? Oh, we better call it something let's call it commercial special. So the term commercial special, it, it's, not, it's not doing anybody any favors. <clears throat> that would be number one. And with regards to this, you know, are we going to continue to rezone it? <laughs> I, I'm not really sure I want to speak for the entire board as to how we see the future of these applications. Oh, sorry. I was asking about the ones that have, in the past, been rezoned. And what about them? Is, this, is the rezone uh, limited to just the solar? That's what, that's what they're saying, that it's limited to solar. Uh -huh. And there have been, uh, there seems to be some debate over whether a reversion can actually take place. There's a faction that says, yes, we'll make this a condition every time. And then there's a faction that says, no, that's completely illegal and you can't do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to want to ask. Al, for clarification, on the solar proposals that 
had gone through and been approved by the planning board, the town uh, council, everything. On any of those, did they have a case where the array size was smaller than the parcel of the land and the commercial zone change only occurred for the array size? <coughs> Not in my realm. No. No, all of those, the entire property, entire property zone. Yeah, yes, to you for the first part of your question. The array was smaller than the entire parcel size, but I can't recall that the rezone did not encompass the entire area. Well, that's something because we could double check just to make sure. Other than farms. I realized I had two things I forgot to bring up. Uh, one of them is I'm very much into trying to get the highest efficiency out of the solar farms that we possibly can get. Either by reducing the footprint and the impact and keeping the you know the uh, megawatts up where they would have been or keeping the footprint and up in the megawatts so we don't have to do as many other cuts uh, and, and use of other properties in town. So in a way there's sort of going to be a limit on how much uh, is going to be allowed to get into the grid. Uh, California is, I forget what their percentages are, but they're kind of at the point now where uh, they're not built, I may be wrong on this, but basically you don't likely build so much solar that it's doing everything for you, unless they get the battery storage or something else figured out. So there will be a limit. Uh, the other point I want to make, uh, listening to the comment here, was that uh, we have commercial and manufacturing zones. When we pick those zones, such as at the exits, we pick them for what we consider to be manufacturing and commercial uses, uh, office buildings, uh, high-tech profiles type of projects. Uh, we did not, as it, I mean, I've been involved in town long enough, so I feel like I say we, uh, that uh, we did not intend those to include something like solar that takes up a lot of space, doesn't have, doesn't pay any uh, body a living wage. Uh, it doesn't have any traffic. I mean, we're putting them at the exit so that people get off the highway, get back on, and not not destroy, the, you know, slow, slow down the traffic in the rest of the town. Uh, so the idea that we we have the same thing with gravel banks. Our, our zoning ordinance right now tells you that the only place you can have a legal gravel bank, unless it's grandfather, is the manufacturing zone. We have zero sand and gravel deposits in manufacturing zones that are commercially viable. We have lots of sand and gravel in residential areas that's commercially viable. So you can't always just say, boom, here's our manufacturing zone, this is where your solar has got to go. It, it needs to go where it needs to go. And in a dense neighborhood of houses, I think we have pretty strong feedback that that's not a great place to put it. 195 acres next to 250 acres, next to 250 acres, next to I-95, <coughs> next to land trust land. How can you find a better place? Sorry. It's, it's, it's obvious place except for the zone. I get it. Anyone else? Yes, Jim. Uh, I'd just like to confirm what you said earlier on, about these special designations. Okay. They, uh, uh, historically, when zoning map amendments were made that had uh, use limitations put on it, conditions, or some other restrictions, Okay, they were they were special, distinct from uh, all of the wide range of uses that could be done on those various zones. So they were carried forth because there were special conditions or restrictions applied to those map changes that were made. Those when this zoning ordinance was adopted, those restrictions and conditions were carried forth on those properties, and they were designated as special, manufacturing special, commercial special, because there was, the council put special things on it. Now, so, 
subsequent to the adoption of the zoning ordinance, the town council seems to have you know, continued in that vein, if you will, when they rezoned things for certain reasons. And rather than a straight manufacturing or a straight commercial, it would be what I've seen quite often here is, is again, commercial special with limitations. And that was done right over here at Exit 1. Uh, one of the first things that I started done when they changed it to manufacturing special for an oval lighting. So yeah, you can manufacture there, but you're only going to manufacture lighting equipment and lighting equipment only and blah, blah, blah. So you, never, you didn't have the range of everything that was in the, the use table for manufacturing. Now subsequent, they went back and they removed that restriction because it was too restrictive if you want, if you want to attract another manufacturer. But, but again, that's, you're 100% you're right what you're saying is that that's the way this council has, whenever they've rezoned things, they've been reluctant to just say, okay, it's manufacturing. When they rezone something, they want to know precisely what they're going to get when they rezone it. And quite often, they put in reversion clauses, you know, again, whether they're legal or not, I don't know, let the judge decide that. But, I mean, that's what the council, that's what this council has historically done that I've seen since I've been here. Yep. They've continued in that name. Yep. Um, so the one person they didn't, though, that was the grant, the countertops, and then that became commercial, and that now has, we had to, as, well, the on that particular case there, right? the council did, did uh, put special conditions on that in, in as much as they identified, I believe, two or three uses that are in manufacturing that will not be allowed there. And I think trucking was one of them and stuff like that. So, so all the other ranges of uses are allowed there except the two or three that were mentioned in that, that thing. And that's why whenever you run across a piece of property here, they come to my office or whatnot, and it has a special on it, I always tell them, I say, go check with the, the clerk, go check with the zoning official, and see what record they have that pertains to that property, because that'll tell you what you're allowed to do here. Okay? Now, there's, there's a large piece of property to the to the east here that we're not that's really not here tonight. And I think it's been mentioned a couple of times what it's zoned as. I'd be interested to see what our zoning official would say about that, what's allowed there. Just think, just think about that for a second. <laughs> as what what could potentially go there. Well, that goes way back. <laughs> Okay, anything else on this one tonight? Yes, sir. Um, I believe in the beginning you were speaking about who you supply uh, the energy credits to, the hospitals and so forth. Are you doing that with any municipalities? Yes, we are actively seeking municipalities that are interested in uh, subscribing to, to these projects. Uh, there, it's a long-term contract. Um, and you're, you're uh, guaranteed a certain discount to the utility electricity rate. That was my question. Okay, very good. All right. Do you have any other questions of us this evening? Have you... You're taking what you need to take away? Be <laughs> <laughs> it good or bad? This has been incredibly valuable, and I appreciate all the unique perspectives and, and feedback. Um, so thank you all for, for the time with this. Do you guys have any questions? Okay, very yes, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next item, public comment. Yes, sir. I would just like to uh, thank you guys for what you do. Um, it's a difficult job. I appreciate the decisions you made for Woodsville Alton and Brushy Brook. I want to let you know that the residents really look at those decisions. Uh, a lot of residents have looked at the comp plan because of your decisions and, and agree with those decisions, and I appreciate that. Um, at the last town council meeting, I made a suggestion to the town council. I was not involved in the uh, 310 Main Street project that was approved. So um, I did a little research because it's a pending court case. And I was shocked when I did that research because I wanted to find out who the developer was. And what I found was that the developer um, went through the process of submitting the application, went through Jim's office, went through the planning board, uh, went through all the hearings. Hearings lasted three, four months, whatever they were. And then the town council voted. But uh, what they didn't realize was the developer's LLC was revoked. So that whole process went on the premise that he had an active LLC. It wasn't the case. How much time was involved? Uh, what I suggested to the town council is when they get the application, Luther had mentioned this, maybe part of the application process is there's a one word sentence. As of the date of this application, is your LLC or construction company active? If they answered yes, fine. I would still check it. It took me about five minutes to go on the Secretary of State's website to review 310 Main Street and Woodville Alton to see that that LLC is not active. You guys spent an awful lot of time away from your family to go through the whole process, and the LLC isn't even an active LLC. That's one of the major points in the court case right now on 310 Main Street. How could you approve a project, I should say you in general, how could that project be approved on an LLC that's not active and had been revoked? It just doesn't make sense. So, so hopefully, hopefully there'll be some change for that. So not to turn public comment into a debate, but I want you to know that I took that issue up with our solicitor. Oh, is that right? Thank you. And what did he say? It was not germane to our discussion. Mm -hmm. So, be that right or wrong, I'm not the solicitor. I just want you to know that I Thank did you. explore that. I wasn't pissing away our time. Once it was brought to my glad, attention. I'm glad you did that. Good. Thank you very much for your comments. Planning Board appreciates that. <clears throat> the date of the next meeting is March 6th. We all good with that? Yes. Unless there's anything else, I'll entertain the motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.